Hello and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I'm Nurse Alyssa and today we're going to be doing a uh, best practice. So a lot of times, I, I've gotten this a lot of times, where people don't really know what best practice wound care is for each type of wound, so say a skin tear. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today, best practice prevention and manage for a skin tear, okay? But first, if you could hit that subscribe button, it would be greatly appreciated as it truly does help my channel reach more people. So let's get started. So prevention and management of a skin tear or any wound for the matter can be broken into a simple plan of care, okay? So as you can see here, um, we have five different steps that we need to look at when we're looking at any wound. So number one is assess and or reassess. Number two is set goals. Number three is assemble a team. Number four is establish and implement a plan of care. And five is evaluate outcomes, whether the goals have been met or not. So for today's video, we're going to be looking at the first three. So this is going to be a two part series, um, just because this video would be extremely long if I didn't break it up into two parts. So just to kind of give you a little mental break. And then at the end of the video, you'll still be able to click on to the next um, series of it, okay? So we're going to start by looking at the assess and or reassess. So the first part of assess or reassess is selecting a valid patient assessment tool. Now, unfortunately for skin tears, there are no actual preventative assessment tools such as like the Braden scale for pressure injuries. There's no valid risk assessment tool. So we go to the next step. So we're going to identify the risk and any causing factors. So general risks are altered sensory, auditory, and visual status, cognitive impairment, nutritional concerns, and polypharmacy. So if a patient is on more than four medications, they are at greater risk of falls. And a lot of times with falls, they're skin tears. Now we'll look at risk caused by impaired mobility. So if they, if a patient has a decreased level of mobility, um, they're unable to reposition themselves, so they need help, um, just assistance with daily living, history of falls, mechanical trauma, these are all things that put them at an increased risk. So when you have um, people moving you in a bed, people uh, moving you from the bed to a chair, it's all increased risk of, of causing trauma and accidentally hitting an arm um, and ripping the skin. Now, because when people get older, their skin becomes more fragile, so it does put them at an increased risk. And that brings us to our next point of the skin. So skin-related changes happen with age and skin does become more fragile, so it is at higher risk of tearing. The next step of assess or reassess is completing a wound assessment if needed, okay? So if we actually have a wound and we're not just in the preventative stages, we need to complete a wound assessment. Now, to accurately assess, document skin tears, it's really important to use common language um, when describing these. Proper documentation is absolute critical for understanding the extent of the problem, and it's really important that skin tears are not classified as pressure injury. Completely two different things. Now, before we assess a wound, we want to make sure that we clean it, um, remove any blood clots that may be there, and possibly any debris. If there is a skin flap there, it should be repositioned as close to normal position as possible, okay? So a lot of times it'll be peeled back. Now you would want to just clean the wound really, really well with some normal saline and take it like a Q-tip and try to pull it back into normal position. Most of the time it's not going to stretch right across back in normal position, but you wanna get it as close as possible. Now I have added in here, these are the different uh, types of skin tears. Um, the first one that we have, there's no skin loss. So it's a linear, it's 
either linear or a flat tear, which can be repositioned to cover the entire wound bed. Now, a type two is a partial flap loss. So this is where the partial flap loss, it can't be repositioned to cover the entire wound as you hear. And then type three, we have a total flap loss. So um, the skin just peel right back and right off. Now we're moving on to step two. So this is set goals. So when we set goals, prevention is always number one, prevention over cure. It's always the cheapest, most cost effective way. And it causes the patient the less harm, right? And that's our number one goal is do no harm. So first is prevention and then um, either determining if it's a healable, non-healable, um, wound. So we are going to base our goals off of the healability of a wound, okay? Not all wounds are able to heal due to comorbidities or um, if they have other things going on, maybe they don't have a lot of uh, blood flow to a limb, especially if it's on a leg, if they have impaired blood flow, that wound may not heal. Unfortunately, um, it, this does happen in a lot of cases, especially with diabetics. So we do have to set goals depending on what type of wound that we're dealing with. So there are three different types of wounds. We have a healing wound, a non-healing wound, and a non-healable wound. So a healing wound is a skin tear that has sufficient, um, vascular supply. So it has a great blood supply. Um, underlying causes can be corrected and the health can be optimized. Um, a non-healing wound is a skin tear that has the healing potential, but there's various uh, patient factors that are compromising wound healing. So this could be a skin tear on, say, the lower leg and they have uncontrolled edema. So if we can get in control of the edema, we can get the actual wound to heal, but sometimes that's just not possible if the patient won't say where their compression stop. Now, a non-healable wound, this is a wound that will not heal because there's there's factors that are compromised um, to make it untreatable, such as a patient who has a terminal disease or in, if they're in the end of life. So what we want to do in this case is we want to prevent further um, complications and to prevent further skin tears from happening. Next, we're going to identify quality of life and symptom control goals. So we want to make sure that our goals as healthcare professionals are in line with our patient's goals because I have seen wounds not heal because nurses or doctors, they haven't taken the time to actually listen to the patient themselves. So what we want to do is we want the patient as part of our team, okay, which we'll see here in step three, assemble our team, but we want to make sure that they're a part of our team and agree with the goals, create the goals with you. Um, so we have an individualized plan. Every plan that doesn't work for just every person. So every person with the skin tear has the same plan. That's not the case. We have to make it specific for that patient or we could get into the into the problem that, that the wound won't heal because they're not complying or agreeing or following um, the care plan. And now we're on to step three, assembling the team. So the key members, they should be identified right off the bat so we know who our team is. And now there can be many people in this team to really make sure that this patient has the ability to heal, has all the support that they need, okay? So I will um, put a list here and kind of go through who may be in part of this team. So first we have clinician with advanced wound care training, okay? So this is going to optimize the care plan and management of the actual uh, injury. We have a diabetic educator. So if the patient has diabetes, we want to make sure that their um, sugars are in control because if we optimize sugar control, then we can optimize wound healing because if their sugars are all over the place, it really impairs wound healing. So an infection disease practitioner. So sometimes our wounds are unresponsive. So after that 21 days, if it's not healing, sometimes we do need to have an infection disease practitioner. Um, especially if this is a reoccurring infection, if 
the general practitioner has already put them on an antibiotic and it's not responding. Sometimes we'll have to uh, get some extra help there. Then we have a nurse practitioner. So sometimes instead of having a doctor, we'll have a, a nurse practitioner as the primary health care provider um, to order any medications, tests, provide any referrals. We have occupational therapists. Um, they can help with pressure redistribution, activities of daily living assessments, cognitive assessments, psychosocial assessments, support counseling, pressure redistribution services, wheelchairs. They really see oversee a wide range. Um, so if somebody is having cognitive difficulties, we can get an occupational therapist. Next, we have personal support workers. So they help with day-to-day -day personal care of the patient. Next, we have the patient with the injury and their family or friends. Um, they're expert in their everyday lifestyle needs and ability to participate in the plan of care, okay? So they need to be on board with the plan of care and they need to really help out because nurses and doctors can't always be there, especially in the home care setting. The patient, we, we really rely on the patient and their family. Um, and sometimes we are even teaching them how to change the dressing. We have a pharmacist for medications. We may have a physiotherapist, a physician, physician, a dietitian, um, an RN, RPN, social worker, speech and language pathologist. Um, this can help with swallowing and communication assessment. It's not really so much for skin tears, but I added it in here because this is how we optimize nutrition and nutrition is super important for our skin and the ability to heal. So sometimes we, if somebody's not able to eat properly, we we do have to have that swallowing assessment. So, and th that comes in place with a speech and language pathologist. Okay. So that's why I've added that in there. And then lastly, we have a surgeon because sometimes we need surgical interventions, deprivement, flap closure, um, if, if a wound isn't healing and it kind of progresses, sometimes we do have to get a surgeon involved. So once we have our team created, we know who's involved, we're going to have to implement the plan of care. And that's going to come in part two. It will be posted in two days from now. Um, and then it will be linked down below and it will be linked at the end of this video. So I hope you have found this part helpful so far. And next we're going to go into the actual plan of care and then into evaluating if our set goals have been met or unmet. So that's all I have for this video, guys. Catch you in my next one. Bye for now.